If you notice, the um, title of the message is A Wolf in Sheep, uh, a Wolf in a Sheep Costume. Because we're going to talk about false teachers today. There have been some recent events that some of you may know of. If not, you're about to learn. Um, I'll keep it PG. But it's the kind of thing that there are many areas of the Christian world that are being rocked right now. There are millions of people whose faith is being shaken and questioned because a particular leader and what has come to light about them. So I want to mention about false teachers and, and the hope and the burden that we put on our teachers rather than Christ. So much that we put on human beings that their rise or fall dictates our own. And that should not be the case. We see all sorts of warnings in Scripture and all sorts of occurrences in the world of false teachers of several kinds. And so I, I don't want to make this just about this one man that I'll get to in a minute, but just in general, how we place uh, on a pedestal human teachers, men and women. But the Bible tells us over and over again not to do that. It says there's going to be false teachers. There's people who are going to say things, stand in a pulpit, wave a Bible, and tell you things that are not true that the Bible doesn't actually say. Now, they may have their reasons for doing that. For some, it may be they actually are deceived into believing those things they're teaching. For some, it may be a great fraud and a con. And we like to think that those are easy to pick out. You know, when you're watching TV and there's a guy sitting there with gold cufflinks telling you to give money for a charity, let's feed these homeless. How about you sell your cufflinks and you'll feed them for half a year instead of me giving, well, I mean, you need to give anyway, but you see the fraud, you see the con man, you see the, we see that stuff go on. But then there's also the fact that we see church leaders who were teaching the right thing that fall into immorality. Scandals, extramarital scandals, drug use, other forms of immorality. And, and, and it's a slippery slope. We're very well-intended, very well-meaning people. Don't keep a guard up here or there. And, and they, they, they cross a line just a little bit. And then that becomes easy. And then they go just another step forward. And they might be conflicted about it, but then that becomes easy. And next thing you know, they're in a full-blown sinful lifestyle. But of course, their message is not dependent on their righteousness because the message that they're preaching doesn't come from them. It comes from God. So we do not judge the message on the messenger. <clears throat> and oftentimes those are things where we may see and understand that temptation can sometimes win out and that our brother or sister needs to be led back, discipled, given grace, prayed for. But then there are those times where what you have is not someone who's just saying wrong things. It's not someone who fell into a temptation, stumbled into sin. It is someone who purposefully, knowingly sought out people to take advantage of and abuse. Predators. You know, I think that the vast majority of churches are staffed with and filled with people who do not do these things. But some events came to light recently that really, there's certain things. I always tell you, I love preaching through the Bible because when you go verse by verse, word by word, through a scripture, it makes you preach things that you may not want to preach, and it gives you the full context and the full message. I don't tend to prefer doing topical things where I could easily kind of misconstrue, but every now and then there's something that comes along that says we need to stop and we need to talk about this. I don't know how many of you are familiar with or have followed the ministry of Ravi Zacharias. He is a well-known international speaker, author, Christian leader. He died last year, I believe it was stomach cancer. Um, cancer of some kind. Multinational ministry with offices all over the globe. He was originally from India. Um, just well, well-known name. 
among Christians and as well. I mean, he, he was one of the go-to people if someone uh, in a secular media wanted to hear the Christian perspective. He was often on um, secular talk shows and representing often, honestly, genuinely, truthfully representing what Scripture says. A few years ago, uh, a lady came forward and said, what was going on there? It's getting really hot there. I don't know what changed. Does that sound better? Are y'all hearing that? Is that good? Yeah. That's better? That sounds a little better to me. That's better to you? Still yeah, there's a little bit of ringing going on. Did you touch something? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, a little bit going on there. I'm not sure. Because it wasn't there, and all of a sudden it was. So, um, while our expert crack <laughs> tech team assesses the issue, test, test, is that, is that getting better? It's still there. I can still hear it. Um, okay, that did it? That good? Okay. Sound good? It's better. It's better. Okay, we'll, we'll go with better. A couple of years ago, a lady came forward and there were apparently some salacious emails that had been exchanged. And um, it got, the story got spun to where it appeared that her and her husband were attempting to extort money out of this minister. Well, fast forward a few years now, there seem to be some other things coming to light. And so the ministry, the organization, hired an outside investigative firm and gave them full, complete, total access to do an investigation. And the things that came to light are outright villainous. It's not a righteous man who fell into some oops and gave into some temptation. I would not suggest that you seek out the report and read the details. I wish I hadn't. Some of the things that are in there are now in my mind and I will never be able to get them out. Hopefully, gracefully, the Lord will help me forget some of it. But here are some of the basic facts. that What we saw in the life of Ravi Zacharias was that there was an ongoing, over the years, and the investigation stopped like seven or eight years, and they said, okay, that's enough. So there could be tons more out there that we don't know about. But it was ongoing abusive relationships with multiple women in multiple countries, abuse of ministry funds where he was able to get sort of side charity things for certain deals, but he was actually using those to um, give gifts to these women. What went, on, what went on was an ongoing grooming process. And if you're familiar with what that word is in the context of abuse, it is where the abuser actually purposefully, manipulatively plans and, and manipulates the relationship to put themselves in, in a position of power over their victim so that the victim will receive the abuse. What we see exposed is a double life. It's not just that some indiscretions here or there are being hidden. It was outright, ongoing, purposeful, predatory abuse going on. And many of you may not know who Ravi was, or if you know he was, you maybe not followed his ministry, but, but this brings up, I don't, I'm not necessarily talking about Ravi, but it brings up the issue of what do we do when our heroes turn out to be villains? Whenever religious leaders, whenever the people who stand in a pulpit turn out to be not only sinners, but playing for the other side. It's not that they weren't godly, it's that they were purposefully, maliciously treating others bad. What I want to say to you, and I will say to you over and over again, is that you must remember your faith is rooted in Christ and the truth that is taught in Scripture. Amen. Your faith is not in a man, a teacher, a preacher, a pastor. You know, Scripture says the truth will set you free. And Christ is talking about the bondage that we are in to sin, but there's also many kinds of bondage that we have. There are times when we could be in bondage to 
our reverence or admiration for a particular teacher, preacher, pastor, mentor, leader, to where it becomes the case that our hope and our faith is built on them and not on Christ. We need to view our mentors and our leaders and our teachers and our heroes through the lens of the gospel and let the gospel of Christ expose who they are. You don't judge the gospel based on them. But too often we get it backwards because people, they get a place in our heart where we revere them, we respect them, we look up to them. It happens. I have preachers, theologians, teachers that I regularly read and listen to that, man, these great men of God love what they have to share. But it's important that we view them through the gospel, not the gospel according to them. Things that we need to understand as we're viewing anyone. We are all sinners in need of grace. God provided that grace in the person of Jesus Christ. He is our salvation. He is our hope. Amen. Fact is, we all sin. Newsflash. We all sin. Even me. I'm probably far on the line. Shouldn't rock your world or your faith whenever a human being sins. The Bible tells you they're going to sin. It's what we do. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, there is none who are righteous, no, not one. Jeremiah 17.9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Mentioned before, we've had conversations with some of you before about just the ridiculous notion that permeates the media and cartoons and everything else about follow your heart. Follow my heart. I know my heart. It's wicked and deceitful. And I love you, but so is yours. We know that about ourselves. There should have been an amen there. Let's try that again. We know that about ourselves, right? Amen. Who has lied to you more than you have lied to you? We fail, we fumble, we give in to temptation. We know this. We know that we want things we shouldn't want. We know that we don't do the things that we should do. So it shouldn't rock our world whenever someone who's in a position of authority does the same thing because they're human too. In fact, if you have a leader who acts like they're perfect or they expect you to view them as if they are infallible, that's a pretty good sign that they're a false teacher and you probably need to have nothing to do with them. The Bible makes it clear that the servant of the Lord is to be humble. Matthew 20, starting in verse 25, it says, Jesus calls the disciples to himself and he says, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You don't put preachers and pastors and teachers on a pedestal that they're somehow better. They are to be humble. Someone who is desiring to be great, right there says, no, 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 no. That's not someone being a godly leader. 1 Peter 5 says, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a few, <clears throat> yeah. I who am a fellow elder and a witness of sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory will be, that will be revealed. This is what he says to the elders, the leaders, the pastors, the teachers, the preachers, those who lead in the church. He says, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you. But be examples of the flock. Pastor is not a king. Ministers are not above suspicion or question. 
The only human beings who speak for and represent the word of God, they wrote it down and you have it right here. If I ever say to you, thus saith the Lord, and it doesn't match this, don't listen to me. There is no fallible, sinful human leader who is worthy of being placed on that pedestal. No one is above questioning. In the case of Rabbi Zacharias, the victim spoke out and was not believed. Why? Well, that's Ravi. Oh, he's this great godly man. He wouldn't do that. Really? Because it turns out years later they found it. Oh, he did. And in the meantime, the person who spoke up, their life has been ruined. It's easy to think, well, certainly not my pastor. He's such a great guy. Not, not my Sunday school teacher. I mean, they're so amazing. No one is above questioning. Our love for and admiration of a person should never override our awareness that they, like the rest of us, are sinners in need of grace. Struggle with the same temptations. Same failings, same faults. As the famous phrase says, before the grace of God, there go I. You remember where that came from? I forget the name of the guy right now, but he, he was, there was a preacher. He was walking down the street and he saw some criminals going to be executed. And he looked at them and he thought, you know, if it wasn't for God, that could easily be me. <coughs> it's healthy to have Heroes. It's healthy to have people that we look up to, that we want to emulate, that we look and go, look, the way they're walking with God, the way that their life appears to be, I want to follow them. Paul even says, I'm following Christ, so go ahead and follow me. But we don't need to forget that we're all fallen. That we're all human, we all, have, we all sin, even our heroes. Our hope and our salvation are from Christ. And him alone. Because he alone is sinless. Christ alone is perfect. One of the first things that I said to y'all five years ago was the one promise that I can make to you as your pastor is I'm going to sin, I'm going to let you down, I'm going to offend you, I'm going to upset you. Because I'm not perfect. Amen. Amen. <laughs> And I'm not. And you shouldn't think I am. I also shouldn't apply that to any other leader, teacher. Right? There's some fantastic teachers out there on the radio, writing books, have podcasts. And you listen to them and you read them and you follow them. Yes and amen, but they're men. They're fallible. They're imperfect. They're sinners just like the rest of us. When human leaders let us down, and they will, our faith should not be shaken because our faith was not in them. I remember hearing the story years ago that uh, it, was, it was before I was born. So my dad was, uh, they were living in New Orleans, and this evangelist came through. I forget which organization he was with. I'm sure if I mentioned it, everybody would probably recognize it. Um, doing huge, you know, massive Philip Coliseum kind of crusades. And my dad went to an event. And it was the preaching of this man that God used to lead my dad to Christ. And years later, that evangelist was discovered to be in the midst of a rather immoral, I believe the term is swinger, lifestyle. I remember asking my dad, well, what did that do to you whenever you found that out? Right? Did, did that shake your faith at all? And he said, no. My faith was in Jesus, not that man. And as it should be. Our leaders, our teachers, our ministers can let us down. But our faith isn't in them. Your faith isn't in me. Oh, goodness, that would be ridiculous. Please tell me your faith isn't in me. It's in Christ.
I lost my place. Oh, we have faith in you. I know. See, there you go. I'll let you down. <sighs> Christ alone is sinless. Christ alone is perfect. Christ alone is true. He is our Lord. He is our teacher. You're a disciple of Christ. You're not a disciple of Mark. You're not a disciple of fill in the blank with whatever teacher. You're a disciple of Christ. That's why we must know what Christ taught. You know, we're doing a read through the Bible in a year. Okay, if you're doing it, that's great. If you feel too much pressure of trying to get it done, you read through whatever, but you need to be reading. And you don't just need to be reading. Do you understand there's a difference between read and study? You need to know what it is that Jesus taught, because if you're going to be a disciple or a disciple and a follower of Christ, you need to know what Christ taught. You don't just need to know what Mark said about it. You're not a disciple of me. You're a disciple of him. So that you cannot be led astray and buy into false teachings and put your hope into false teachers. Galatians 1, verse 8. This is Paul, the apostle Paul speaking. It says, even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let them be accursed. This is the true gospel. You don't take your gospel from man. You don't take your gospel from, from whatever preacher, teacher. This is where the truth is found. You don't judge this by me. You judge me by this. Christ is our hope. Christ alone is sinless. Christ alone is where the truth is found. I want to say something because, um, like I said, because I'm keeping it PG, I didn't go into details. And you don't need to know the details. You probably don't want to know the details. I would actually suggest don't go learn the details. I wish I hadn't. But the fact is, I don't know if it's just that news travels with media and social media, but it seems like in the past years, there's been a lot coming to light of abuse in churches. Everybody, of course, knows of the Catholic church scandal and priests and, you know, there were cover-ups and priests being shuffled around to different places to get them out of jurisdictions and that kind of stuff. Study similarly was done on the Southern Baptist Convention. And it was found that there were many instances of abuse and cover-up even within Baptist churches. <clears throat> So I, I want to say something, because as much as I and my love for you want to think, well, surely not Liberty Hill. But there's lots of places where abuses happen that people thought, well, surely not my church. So I want to say something. In case there's anyone sitting out there, anyone who watches this on video, who has been a victim of abuse, or if you ever are a victim of abuse, there are certain things that often get said. One of them is everybody sins. I, I, I just said, that's one of the things we have to keep in mind as we look at our leaders and we go, well, yes, they're sinners, of course. But I want to make it clear that that statement, that idea that everybody sins is not an excuse. That whenever someone in a position of authority sins or abuses someone, you go, well, you know, everybody sins. No, that is not what that statement is. It is not what it is meant to convey. It is not dismissive shield for abusers to hide behind. Well, you know, because everybody sins. It's not just saying, oh, well, you know, nobody's perfect. Anyone using it that way is complicit in the sin of the abuser. It's also, whenever we say everybody sins, we're all sinful, we've all fallen short. That's not a condemnation of the victim. One thing that often happens with abuse victims is they internalize and they think, well, it's my fault. In the issue of religion and the church being introduced into that, it's, well, it's my fault. Of course, I deserve it. I'm a sinner. So God's letting this happen to me because I deserve it is what is often thought. This is not <clears throat> an admission of your sinfulness is not saying that you deserve what happened to you. That's not what that says. 
we are all only to blame for our own sin. An abuser is the only one who is guilty for their abuse, not the victim. Nothing any victim has done is to blame for the abuse they received. The other day, it was funny, a little argument broke out in my house between um, one of my kids and my nephew about karma. Is karma real? Let me tell you, no! Karma is not a biblical teaching. The Bible does not teach that because you did bad things, bad things happen to you. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches God created a world that functions a certain way, and whenever you step out of line of the way it functions, bad things happen because that's not how they're supposed to be used. You know, like fire. You put fire in the fireplace, it warms your house. You put it somewhere else, it'll burn your house down. Is that because you deserved it? No, it's because you put fire in the wrong place. Karma is not a biblical teaching. Bad things happen because there's bad people who do bad things. <clears throat> not because you deserved it. Also, saying that you are a sinner is not a statement of your worth. It's another one of those things that abuse victims will internalize. Well, I'm a sinner. I'm just so horrible. How could God love me? How can anyone love me? Because I'm such a sinner. The fact is, the Bible teaches you already have inherent worth and value and dignity because you are created in the image of God. The fact that you're a sinner doesn't undo the fact that you were created in the image of God, loved and valued by Him. In fact, the Bible says it's while, while, while we are sinners that God said, I love them. And Christ said, I'll go die for them. Also, if you are a victim of abuse, you are not damaged goods. You know, the Bible teaches about the proper role for intimacy between a husband and wife, and that everything else outside of that. And, and, and I think in response to the sexual revolution, we pushed so hard the opposite way with what it was called purity culture back in the 80s and 90s, that we put ideas into people's heads that are also unbiblical. There's a story, um, uh, a, a preacher, I think it was Matt Chandler, tells about, you know, taking a woman to, you know, um, a, a friend to um, uh, some seminar thing, and, and, and he had no idea what the preacher was doing. He was going to see his friend who was in the band and everything. Well, this was a single mom who had made bad decisions and, you know, ended up, you know, getting pregnant, not married. And well, the, the guy gets up there to, to preach, and his message is on the evils of extramarital sex. And he begins with a rose, and he says, look at this rose, isn't it lovely, isn't it wonderful? Here, he tosses this out to the audience, he says, pass that around, take a look at that rose, isn't it great? And then at the end, he asks, well, where's my rose? Give me my rose back, and he goes, you know, look at this. Who would want this? And it's all, you know, petals falling off, you know, leaves off everything. It's, you know, kind of wilting, and, you know, you know. And in the idea of being, you know, who would want this? And as... Pastor Chandler says it as he's sitting there. He's just thinking, you know, Jesus, Jesus wants it. You're not, you're not damaged goods. You're not unlovable. The stain of the act of abuse is on the heart of the abuser, not on you. If you've been abused, the pain that you suffer does not make you ugly, unwanted, or impure. It reveals the ugliness that is in the heart of the abuser. Lastly, just a word to victims. And this is something that, you know, as you read about abuse victims in churches, sadly a common occurrence is they're silenced or they're not believed. The fact is, if you're a victim of abuse, you need to be heard. There is evil being done to you, and there needs to be somewhere that you can go that you can be heard. Too often, churches and ministries have not done a very good job of listening to or believing victims. And while we certainly value the notion of innocent until proven guilty, by the way, our, our legal system, there's a place we get that, because God values truth. 
Bearing false witness is a sin. False accusations can destroy and ruin lives. But we don't want to go so overboard on that that we make it impossible for those who need to be heard to be heard. We cannot be too quick to dismiss claims just because, well, we want to keep the peace. Oh, what would it do to the congregation if this came out? We can't be quick to dismiss because we want to preserve a reputation. It's a reputation of Christ we're interested in. And covering up sin is bad for the reputation of Christ and for the church. Or we just don't want to see a hard reality. We cannot let those lead us to be dismissive. When we're dismissive, we become complicit in the cover-up of sin. In James 3.1, it says the teachers would be held to a higher standard. 1 Timothy 5, verse 20, it says, Those who are sinning, speaking of elders, of leaders, of teachers, those who are sinning, rebuke them in the presence of all that the rest may also fear. Church leaders, pastors, ministers, preachers, not only are we not to be above suspicion and question, we're to be held to a higher standard, and we're to be publicly held accountable for our sins and misdeeds. All too often, people want to cover it up. People don't want to believe it. Oh, well, no, not my preacher. He's so wonderful. No, maybe particularly your preacher because you think he's so wonderful. I'm hoping that in the weeks to come here at Liberty Hill, we're going to work on some ideas how to ensure that we are not a place where this kind of thing becomes a reality. We need to have safeguards against sinful, predatory leaders getting in a position. And we have to make sure that this is a safe place for victims to come forward and be heard. Now, to the main issue for today, man, there's so much that could be said on this whole thing. A beloved, supposed man of God who literally has impacted the lives of millions of Christians who have read his books, listened to his talks, watched his videos, listened to his radio show, whose faith has been strengthened and emboldened because of him. One of the things we have to think about is what is the impact that it has on us whenever a beloved leader pastor, minister, teacher, falls whenever our hero turns out to be a villain. Remind you, it's the message, not the messenger. God can use flawed mouthpieces to speak the truth. He's doing it right now. He used a donkey, right? Balaam going along. Donkey won't go forward because there's an angel in the road. Balaam starts beating the donkey. God uses the donkey to talk. He can use a donkey. He can use a sinner. We trust the message, not the messenger. Your faith is not in men. Your faith is in Christ. Sometimes people who are mistreated by a church leader or who just maybe had an inadequate reaction from a church, they'll equate, God's ba- they'll equate the church's bad actions with God. There, there's a way where, where that gets projected onto God. Well, you're God's people and you were bad, so what does that say about God? The idea is, well, they didn't care about me, so I guess God didn't either. This way of thinking kind of baffles me. And I don't know if I just had the good fortune of from a very early age being taught that it is Christ, not people, that my faith is in. But I do realize that people make these connections. So, so we have to remember people are flawed. People are fallen. People are sinful. Even good people, even godly people. Have you read Hebrews chapter 11? 
the Faith Hall of Fame? Take a look at the list of people who were held up as heroes of the faith. And then go back to the Old Testament and read about them. David? Wow, where do you begin? How about that he took one of his friend's wife as his own and had him killed? That's a pretty big one, but God still used him. It's the message, not the messenger. All people are fallen and flawed, even the good ones. A person's status or position does not make his words true. Just because I happen to hold the title pastor and stand here behind this wooden podium does not mean that what I'm telling you is true. Christ is truth. The Bible is truth. Jesus is the truth. His words are found in the Scripture. That's where we find our truth. If someone in authority is trying to use religious-sounding language to manipulate and control you, judge their words against the Bible. And if they don't match... Get away from that person. Your faith is not in church leaders or even your fellow members. It's in Christ who demonstrated his love for you and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, paid the price for our sin, that we could be forgiven. That any who would turn from their sin and follow him might be saved. That's what your hope is in. That's where your faith is in. So that whenever those that, you know, whether you have placed them in a hero position, put them on a pedestal and they tumble down, when your heroes are shown to be villains, it shouldn't shake your faith. Because it's found in Christ, not in the lives of flawed people around you. We're not seeking the praise or the glory of men. We're not disciples of men. We're disciples of Christ. And it's His kingdom that we walk in, that we follow after. And it's in Him where we place our hope. Glory to you, King of all days. Glory to you, in the highest place